Today, um, Matt, our pastor, will be preaching uh, from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 to verse 23. So I will read those now. Uh, please, if you've uh, got a Bible, uh, please turn to it. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Um, if you're building a quiz team for a pub quiz, you usually gather a team together where you've got you know, various knowledge. So you might have somebody who's brilliant at sports, somebody who knows a lot of history, somebody who's brilliant at music, which in our church is Laura Crosby. I don't know if she's here this morning. But if you want a quiz team and you need somebody to get all the music and all the films, Laura's basically an encyclopedia of knowledge for that. So if you've got a quiz team and you're struggling for music, find Laura, put her on your team. But a few weeks ago, uh, Steve and I were at a quiz um, and uh, it was organised by the, the running club in town. Uh, but you didn't get to pick your team. You, you could go in with the person who brought you, if there was two or three together, but your teams were put together randomly. Uh, you were pleased to know we did, we did us proud and we won. Um, but it was, it, in a sense, a fluke because we didn't pick our team. We didn't know who was going to be on it. We didn't know whether we'd be I mean, you know, just the same set of knowledge or we'd have a whole bunch of other knowledge together. Fortunately, we had people who knew loads of different things and uh, we won. But it was by chance, in reality. Um, the only way to guarantee a win in a quiz like that where you're thrown together is if you give a backhander to the quiz master and he gives you the answers, right? That's the only way you can guarantee a win. You want to win, you need the quiz master to give you the answers. You've got to know. You've got to know what's coming and you've got to know what the answers are. And in this passage in uh, Ephesians 1, 15 to 23, the key to what Paul wants uh, the Ephesians to hear and think about and listen to is it's about knowledge. It's about knowing and particularly, it's about knowing God. So the question is, what do they need to know about God? And what is it that Paul wants them to, to get at? Now, 15 to 23 are one long sentence, the same as 3 to 14 were one long sentence when Paul wrote it. And Paul links these two sentences together by that first phrase. He says, for this reason so it looks back to what he said in verses 3 to 14 about all of the blessings that are given to those who are in Christ and then it looks forward in uh, verse 15 to your hearing about their faith in the Lord Jesus and about their love for all of God's people and Paul says in light of those two things in light of the fact of all this that God has done for you in Christ and in light of the fact that I see that evidenced in you by your faith in Jesus and your love for other people, Paul says, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you all the time. Verse 16, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Paul knows God and Paul knows the Ephesians and he's heard about the ones he's never met before. And that combination leads him to overflowing in thankfulness to them. Now, can you imagine reading that for the first time? Some of the guys hearing this when it was read out for the first time would have known Paul. They'd have been there when Paul planted the church. They'd have sat under his ministry for the time he pastored the church. And this would have been great for them to hear. But even for the people who Paul hadn't met, the ones who joined the church, who'd been saved since he left, they would also be thinking, oh, this is Paul. We know him. We've heard about him. And he's telling us he's praying for us. And so there would have been a massive sense of togetherness here of, wow, we are... 
We're still thought of by Paul. He is still praying to God for us. We are now together, uh, thankful, joyful um, that we are in Christ and that Paul is praying for us. And that Paul's longing for them is that they keep growing. Now, I don't know about you, but I find it really easy to just simply pray about all the troubles that I know are going on. Whether that's troubles in my own life or troubles in somebody else's life. Mm, Knock my microphone off. Or troubles in uh, the lives of um, people in the church or the, the church as a whole or whatever it might be. I struggle to not just pray about them and think about them all the time and instead think about uh, the good things that are going on. But actually what Paul says here is that he's thankful. Now, I think we should take a lesson from that, shouldn't we? We should take heart from that, that Paul is not firing at the church. I know you've got this trouble, I've got this trouble, you've got that trouble. But I'm encouraged that you love the Lord and you love his people. As a result of these verses, first of all, the one thing I, I want to take away from me, having think, thought about this and prepared it this week, and one thing I want you to take away is that I want to be more consistently thankful to God for you it's too easy as the pastor to think about all the problems that are there but I want to be more consistently thankful for you and for his work in you now Paul is specifically praying to God but what does he say about who this God is he says I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ the glorious father may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation the God of our Lord Jesus Christ the glorious father Paul is speaking to the father who he has just said in verse 3 is the giver of every spiritual blessing in Christ Paul says he's praying to a generous God when we come to prayer do we remember that's who we're approaching we're coming to a generous God we're not coming to a tyrant in the sky who we need to somehow appease or placate we don't we don't come to we won't come to a, a, um, a despotic ruler some kind of um, tyrant in the sky we don't come either to a forgetful old man he's not kind of sat there in his armchair we don't have to nudge him and wake him up and try and remind him that he's got a job to do we don't come to a tight-fisted boss whose arm we've got to twist behind his back to get him to do anything. We don't even come to the cosmic version of a decent human dad who might just be having a bad day. We're coming, Paul says, to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. We're coming to a Father who we are told loved us and chose us before the dawn of time. We're coming to a father who we are told has granted us forgiveness and redemption through the precious blood of his son. And we're coming to a father who last week Dennis brought to us has, in, from verses 11 to 14, has given us his spirit as the guarantee of our future inheritance of eternal life. Now when we remember that that is who we're coming to, that is who this father that Paul speaks about is, what he is like, doesn't that just make us want to pray? I think it should, but I think the reason maybe we often don't pray is we forget that's what he's like. I know that if I knew our father better and remembered what he was like more often, I'd want to speak to him more. And so what is it Paul asks for then? What does he come to this generous father and ask? In one sense, it's very simple. A spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. That's it. The Ephesians, all I want you to know, I want you to know God better. I want you to have a greater and deeper knowledge of God. What's the one thing you really want? What would finish this sentence? If only I had. Maybe it's a better paying job. Maybe it's a nicer house. Maybe you sat there thinking if I had a husband or if I had a wife or if I had kids. Maybe you wished you had a more understanding or caring husband, wife, or kids. Maybe you wished you had nicer neighbours. Maybe you wished you had a job you actually enjoyed rather than something that was just really dull and boring. Maybe in the current crisis you wished you had an infinite supply of petrol so you didn't have to keep getting in the queues. 
Maybe you're a bit more trivial and you just wish you had a lifetime supply of chocolate. But in light of all these blessings that Paul says are, are uh, belonging to those in Christ, he prays for one thing for them. A greater knowledge of God. That's what he really wants for them. The one thing Paul says I really want for you is that you would know him better. But that knowledge of God, that knowing him better, Paul says, has to come by God giving it to them. He has to reveal it to them. He has to show it to them. This knowledge can only come through the Holy Spirit, who is the spirit of truth. This knowledge can only come if the eyes of their heart are enlightened, verse 18. Truly knowing God can't be achieved by clever people trying really hard to understand and work it out. Paul isn't saying, though, either that they have to have the Holy Spirit in an extra special way. Let's not get the idea that somehow Paul's changed what he said in the previous few verses. Paul has said, if you are a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit living in you. So your eyes are already open to the truth because you've come to trust in Jesus. But Paul is saying he wants the Spirit to keep teaching you more of who God is and what he is like. He wants them to grow in their knowledge and understanding of the Father through the Son by the Spirit. Because the Christian life in general, like all of life in general, isn't static, is it? None of us stayed five years old, did we? You might wish you'd stayed five years old. Life might have been more simple. Maybe you liked school. But none of us stayed five years old. None of us stayed 25 years old. If you've not reached there yet, it's coming. We all grow. We all mature. Some of us quicker than others. Those of us who are genuinely saved will change. Going back to what Paul said there about faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and love for all of God's people, that is because Paul knows they are saved. That's why he can say that. He's seen it evidence. Because they have been saved, this has happened. They wouldn't trust Jesus and love other Christians if they weren't saved. And just like that salvation that has to be given to them because God chose them before the dawn of time, this knowledge of God is something that God has to give them. Now, I don't know whether you've seen uh, the Disney film Big Hero 6. One of the main characters in this film is called Baymax. He's basically a giant marshmallow. He looks like the old Michelin Man. Remember the Michelin Man for the tyres? Basically, Baymax looks like that. And he's, in this film, he's basically a robotic nurse. A huggable robotic nurse. And he's programmed with all of these things to figure out what's wrong with you and to treat you on the spot. And it's all because he functions with a memory card inside him. Now, as the film goes on, the little boy Hero wants to make Big Max, Baymax have some more functions. He doesn't want him just to be this huggable nurse. He wants him to be able to do karate. So he downloads the information from the internet and makes Baymax able to do, like, all of karate in an instant. Now... What we need to realise here is that, yes, God has to reveal to us, give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation so that we can know him better, but it doesn't mean that what we're doing is then we sit in an armchair and wait for God to give us some kind of download from a heavenly server. God reveals himself to us clearly in his word, in that Bible that you hold in your hands. And God has given you if you're a Christian, the Holy Spirit to enable you to spiritually understand that word. Now, I'm an advocate of, of having a time, a place, and a plan when it comes to reading the Bible. It helps with routine, it grows discipline, somewhere where you can sit and work through Scripture each day and grow in knowledge and understanding of God. So I guess the question is, well, how are we going to do that better? As Christians, if that's what we, we need, we need God to give us that, but he's not just going to download it into our heads. How are we going to do that? How are we going to grow in knowledge and understanding of God? First thing is, is your Bible open on a regular basis? Are you looking at it? Or is the Bible just a bonus add-on on the days where you're less busy? Now, I don't say that so you can tick a box and say, great, Matt says as long as I'm reading my Bible, everything will be okay. Tick. I'll go home now. I don't need to listen to the rest of what he says because I did that this morning. And I also don't say that to make you feel guilty if you sat there thinking, I ain't had my Bible open for weeks. Because actually, if all you go away from any sermon that is ever preached from this 
pulpit is with a list of things to do, then it, in reality, whoever's been stood here, whether it's me or somebody else, has failed. Because what, what we want to happen, what all of us should be aiming for and praying will happen when the word is preached here, is that we'll run to Jesus. Is that each of us will run to Jesus. Not run to a list of things to do. The open verses of this uh, letter to the Ephesians have shown us that we have an awesome God who has given us everything that we need. A God who wants us to know him. And it is in his word and by his spirit that he's designed that that will take place. So read the Bible, absolutely. Find a time, find a place, get a plan for reading it and working it out. But don't do it because you have to. Do it because you want to. Because you want to know this outrageously good God better. And don't just read it yourself either. See, the, the problem with saying we should all have a quiet time and it needs to, you need to do it regularly and whatever, and we, we beat ourselves up about it when it doesn't happen is we've made Christianity an individual thing. As long as it's me and my Bible and I read it during the week, then that's fine. It doesn't matter what I do with everybody else. It doesn't really matter if I turn up at church. It doesn't really matter if I study it with anybody else. It doesn't really matter if I ever discuss the Bible with anybody else. But actually, learning together is massively important. So why we're a body together. The body of Christ, the bride of Christ, God's household. That's how the word describes us. And we need to remember it's a lifelong journey. We're never going to reach a point ever in our lives where we know enough about God that we can just stop praying that this will happen. Stop praying that we'll know him better. Whether you've been a Christian for five minutes, whether you've been a Christian for 55 years, this prayer that Paul prays for the Ephesians so that you will know him better should be your prayer. But it's also really important to realise that this knowledge is not just facts about God. And I, being a fact-based person, it's the way my brain works, need to hear this repeatedly. This is not about knowing facts about God. Yes, I need to know God is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. They are truths that I need to know in my head. And yes, I need to know that God is all-powerful. Yes, I need to know that God is unchanging. Yes, I need to know that God is holy. Whatever else you might want to say in there, I need to know all of those things. But it's no good if they're just in my head. It's also not even about just routine attendance of church services and ministries. It's not even about, as I've said, being disciplined in Bible reading because you can be physically present in church or you can be reading the printed words in the Bible and none of it can make any difference. It's not magic to do those things. The knowledge of God that Paul prays for here is not just fact-based. It is a personal, experiential knowledge of God. It is about a deepening relationship with him. Spiritual maturity doesn't come through knowing more facts about God because the devil knows all the facts about God. All of them. He knows way more facts about God than you do. Spiritual maturity doesn't come from adding more routine or ritual to your life. Great, I'll do something with church every day of the week. Then I'll be sorted. It's not it either. Think about it like a marriage. Now, I've told you a few stories about Nancy and I over the last uh, few years. We've been married for 11 plus years. Um, but let's, let me give you one practical example. Just before our eldest was born, my mom and a couple of other people said they wanted to throw Nancy a surprise baby shower. Right? Uh, they wanted to know whether I thought it was a good idea or not. And I thought it sounded great. I knew Nancy wasn't mad keen on attention, but you know, I thought she'll appreciate it really deep down. That people have thought about her, they want to look after her, celebrate the fact she's become a mum for the first time, um, and so on. I, I was wrong, <laughs> let's just say that. Fortunately for me, though, Annie was born before the baby shower ever happened. So, Nancy, to this day, will tell you that was the biggest relief for her. Now, I knew in my head, in here, fact-based, Nancy didn't really like that kind of thing, but... I still thought, nah, I'm sure. I'm sure she'll really appreciate it deep down. Now I realise, years on, because our relationship, by God's grace, is deeper, that it would have been an absolute nightmare. And she'd have hated every single minute of it from beginning to end. 
What we're talking about here, when Paul talks about knowing him better, is truly knowing God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit personally and experientially. Knowing, he wants them to know in their hearts. He wants them to know the depth of God's character and relate to him. Because God is not just a subject to be studied. He is three persons to know. A wonderful saviour to love. A faithful friend to walk with and a glorious Lord to worship. See, knowing God is more than just facts. Because the knowledge needs not just to be in our heads, but in our hearts. Now before you think the pendulum then is swinging to the other side from facts to emotions, it's not just about emotions either. Because emotions change all the time. You might be sat here today thinking, I feel really close to God today. But you also might be sat here thinking, I feel a million miles away from God today. But is God closer to one of you than the other? No. You might feel that's the case, but the fact is, God has said if you are a Christian, then nothing can separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Whether you feel that way or not, the reality is fixed. But that truth should then stir our emotions, shouldn't it? It should make us think, wow, that is amazing. Paul prays for increased knowledge of God because only God can give it. Yes, the means are through his word, through prayer, through when we take communion together, through thinking about uh, our baptism, through meeting with one another, through studying it, through sometimes somebody sending you a message saying, how amazing is that sunset tonight that God has given us? But it's a personal knowing of God. Paul then gets specific. Doesn't he? Verse 18 through to 19. Why does he want them to know God better? So that they will know these things. Three things. When you know something, you remember it above all other things. So you probably learned that 2 plus 2 equals 4 in primary school at some point, right? Now you just take it for granted that you know that's the case. You don't use it every day, but you know it's true. You know the world is round. And you know that whether you're sailing on a boat towards the horizon and worrying that you're going to drop off the edge, or whether you're just living day to day, you know the world is round. You know that the sun is going to rise and the sun is going to set, whether the, whether the sky is full of black clouds or whether it's as clear as crystal. Paul wants them to know and to remember, and he has three things that he says he wants them to know as a result of knowing God better. The hope to which he has called you. The riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe. As we look at them, think about these things. What difference do these make? And how do they make you feel? See, the hope that is there is the hope of eternal life. That inheritance that he's just said a few verses earlier is guaranteed because of the Holy Spirit. It is something, though, that has already happened. Paul talks about it in this past tense of... The hope that God has called you to. He's already called you to something that is going to happen and it's sure and certain. The better that we know that, the more assurance we have of what God has done, the more we'll live that out. We'll remember that even on our worst days, in our darkest days, that we are loved because of this hope that he has called us to. We'll remember that even if we've fallen in that sin, the same thing again, that the Father is waiting for us with arms wide open and compassion and his spirit can help us to repent and believe again. The riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. The Holy Spirit, he said, is our deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. He is the down payment. The fullness of that inheritance is going to be knowing and enjoying God forever in eternity. In a new heavens and a new earth. Something to look forward to, isn't it? Something to hold on to when all around us seems like chaos. And the immeasurably great power, he says, towards us who believe. Now look at this power. It is, it's a stunning power, isn't it? So apparently it's a new feature, and I've not seen it. You might have seen it, I think it's on BT Sport, where you can, um, when a goal goes in, you can press a button apparently, and it puts up a load of features. It tells you how fast the shot was, all kinds of weird statistics about it. It's a bit crazy. I don't know why you'd want it, but there you go. It'll tell you the power of the shot that was hit. Now, if you're a football fan like me, it's pretty if you grew up in the 90s, you'll remember some people who could hit a ball hard. Remember Tony Yeboah for Leeds, anybody? He could smack a ball hard. He nearly took the crossbar off down at Wimbledon. 
Um, there's a few players who you could think, man, they could hit the ball hard. That was power. If you're a boxing fan, there's been some big fights, right? Big fights. Some of those guys can hit hard. I, I wouldn't want to be hit by Anthony Joshua or Tyson Fury or any of them because the reality is if they hit me with one punch, I'd probably be dead. And my mind just knocked out. They hit hard, right? But this power that Paul talks about here that he says is working in us who believe, is for us who believe, is the same power, he says, that raised Jesus from the dead. That is the power that's at work in us. Now, it needs to be the power that's at work in us, because when we get to next week, at the beginning of chapter 2, we'll realise we're dead, if we didn't already realise that, without Christ. And so we needed resurrection power. But we also see that, that resurrection power is given the power that raised Christ from the dead is the power that is at work in us. And we need it, and we'll think about this in way more detail when we get to chapter 6, because we are in a battle with sin, the flesh, and the devil, the world, all the time, day by day. But it's provided, isn't it? Paul wants us to know that the power that is at work in us is the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. It's the same power that then has put Jesus on the throne of heaven above all other powers and authorities and rulers. Everything's at his feet. And to cap it all off, he says, this same Jesus Christ who is above all other authority is the head of the church. For us, he's our king, he is our shepherd, he is our Lord. And so look at who Jesus is here. Again, look at who Jesus is. He is the one who was raised from the dead after dying on the cross for the sins of all those who put their trust in him. He is the one who is seated at the right hand of the Father, reigning over all. And so the challenge then here for you, if you're not a Christian, is this. There is a serious warning by implication of these words. Because Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is above every power in the universe. Everything is under his feet. And so one day, every knee will bow before Jesus. Either willingly with great joy, or because they have to in great terror. And this same King Jesus is the one who hung on the cross after living a perfect life. The same Jesus in whom there is forgiveness of sins, back in verse 7. This is the same Jesus who has died in your place if you will come to him. This God who rules over all is also the God who wants you to know him and has done everything to make that happen. And so there is a warning there, yes, that Jesus is this Lord over all, but do you see that he is this generous God, this gracious saviour, this humble king who is willing to give his life to rescue you. Who is willing to give his life for rebels, people who have rebelled against him, and yet he is willing to save. God would call you to come to be part of his family today. His arms are open to welcome you in. His son's sacrifice is sufficient to pay for all of your sin. Even the sins that no one else knows about, the deepest, darkest parts of you that you'd never want to air publicly. God knows them all and Jesus' death is sufficient to pay the price for it all. And the Bible would say that the Spirit of God will then come and live in you if you repent and believe in Jesus. And he will then help you to live for him for the rest of your life. So if you're not a Christian, the question is, do you want to know a God who is like this? Because you can, if you will turn from your sin and trust in Jesus. And if you're a Christian then, this is wonderful news, isn't it? That Jesus is the one who is seated above all. That he is your king, your saviour, your friend, and he is above all other powers. And it's also wonderful news that the power that raised him from the dead is at work in you. That means when you are fighting against sin, when you are seeking to stand against the devil's lies, when you feel weak, he is strong. When the world looks stronger than the church, on the surface, underneath the reality is that it's not. And so the more we know our God, 
The more we grasp these truths, the more we will be free from fear, even from fear of death, because we know that our King, the Lord Jesus Christ, is on the throne and will be with him forever. Now finally, just as we close, look back at verse 17. Look at remember, and remember again what it is that Paul prays continually. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Make that prayer a prayer for yourself. Make it the prayer you pray for the rest of your church family each day. Make it the prayer for our elders as we seek to lead this church under God's hand. Make that the prayer for our mission partners who are in other parts of the world. Make that the prayer for other Christians who live in Stockton and Northeast in the UK in other parts of the world. Make that your prayer on a regular basis. What a difference it would make, wouldn't it? If that is what we were regularly praying for each other, that we would know God better.